I gotta tell you, last week, um, last week I thought the service was fantastic, even though it was another snowstorm, but my favorite part of the entire service last week was after, when nobody left. We all just kind of hung out, we had a cup of coffee, we chatted, we were just getting to know each other. It was my favorite part, and it was awesome to sit back and just kind of watch um, and, and engage with other people, but being able to see people engaging with one another, because I got news for you folks, that is what the good stuff is. Uh, it's us getting to know each other and uh, sharing life with one another. Um, we've been going through this series of passages that we're calling A Road to Victory, and we're going to take it all the way up through Easter. We have a couple of really great um, series coming up after uh, The Road to Victory, so I'll just keep, keep your eye out. We're going to keep, uh, keep talking about it, but we're going we're to try and tackle what it means to be an authentic community. And all of this has been going on around the, the passages in Luke 9, 23 through 27. Today we're only going to share Luke 9, 23 and 24, which is, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. I'm calling this sermon today, What Do You Mean? And I want to say it again so it really, really dives in. What do you mean? Because Jesus can say these words to us, but most of us have a hard time, and, and I'm speaking for myself, but I, I share life with enough people to know that I am not the only one that struggles with knowing what this actually means. And last week we talked about the hard discussion of what it means in our family life. What does it mean with our kids? What does it mean with our babies? What does it mean with, with this thing that we, we have so much invested in that we can't help but to control it? And today I want to talk about uh, something that, that can be even harder for people. Uh, my, my kids are grown. I mean, my, I, I don't have little kids in the house where I have to, you know, make sure that they're getting up for school and they're making sure they're getting their homework done and all that. That, that part of, that part of a, a family life is out of my life now, and I'm, I'm excited that one day I might get to experience that from a different perspective where I can sugar them up and send them home. Um, <laughs> because I have the control to do that. But we've been going through all of these different stories, and I want to just be absolutely clear. We are together as a community saying, okay, God, you're telling us to just release control of this stuff. God, you're telling us that we need to do this. And, and a lot of times we, we burrow into that as a personal thing, like we have to do this. Like I'm just going to get right with God, and I'm just going to take care of this. And, and then what we're doing is, is we're taking control of letting go of control. So what we want to say as a community is, is that we don't do this alone because we can't do this alone. We're not called to do this alone. And one of those, one of those uh, words that was a buzzword around church for a while was these words introvert and extrovert. And we were supposed to respect who, whether or not a person was an introvert or, or an extrovert. And if somebody was an introvert and just wanted to sit off quietly alone, that they could be able to do that. And I say, I don't care if you're an introvert or an extrovert. If people want to love on you and they want to speak into your life, that's got nothing to do with that personality type. As a matter of fact, God's called us that no matter what, if, if you're an introvert, God made you an introvert. Do you think he made you an introvert so people wouldn't talk to you and leave you alone? No, he built you that way for a reason. And we're all built a certain way for a reason, but we cannot express or fulfill the purpose that God's given us if we don't first let go, release control, lay it down, whatever. But what does that actually mean? So we're bouncing around from these stories. And today I want to talk about a couple of people, a couple of key characters in the Bible. One is like a rock star in the Bible, right? If you ask anybody in the world who the most popular apostle is, they're going to come up with two names. The first one's Paul, the second one's Peter. And in that order, based on, on people. They, people actually do these polls. I don't know why, and I don't know if they're getting paid for it, but it seems ridiculous because uh, I could be doing that very easily. But Paul and Peter are the two most recognizable disciples because... Peter's the guy that Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my church on you, the rock. Okay? And, and think about that for a moment, because we're going to, we, honestly, I could preach 52 weeks a year on the areas where Peter failed. On the areas where Peter failed alone, I could preach on that. And this is the person that Jesus says, I'm going to build my rock on. So Peter's the first guy. We're going to be talking about a rock star in the Bible because, you know, Jesus loved this guy a lot. Even when Peter lied to him, even when Peter denied him, Jesus never stopped with the idea that he loves this guy. 
But then we're going to talk about a guy that most people don't know unless they come to church on Easter. And it's this guy, his name's Malchus. And listen, if you ever want your kids to hate you forever, name him Malchus. Okay? It's up there. It's a bad name. But Malchus is important in this, in this uh, discussion that we're going to have about Peter. Because in this moment where Jesus was, was getting ready to fulfill his destiny, where he was getting ready to take the cross for you and me, when he was getting ready to fulfill this Easter story that we all know, there's this guy, Malchus. And there's these, there's these guards that come to arrest Jesus. And it's a fantastic story. So I want to talk about that a little bit today. Because I think that we all have Malchuses in our life. We all have Malchuses in, my, in our life. And I want you to hear that before I start talking about it. If you don't know who Malchus is, I still want you to hear that. I want you to keep that in the front of your mind as we start talking today. We all have Malchuses in our life. So we are in John chapter 18, starting with verse 1. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it and follow along. Otherwise, we have it on the screen. And Rhiannon got me a new Bible. And uh, tall order because I'm very picky. Um, and I love my Bible. I mean, my, that was my first Bible I got when I, decided, when I answered the call to be a pastor. It was soft and it was thin, and the papers were just like, it just smelled good. And, uh, but I have been reading this one for the better part of this week, and I love it. And so thank you very much, because I, I do. It's a little bigger and heavier, but I love this Bible, and it should match. So, we'll see. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief, chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Nothing says we're coming to, to do malicious intent like torches, and weapons, okay? If somebody, if a group of people is coming at you and they're carrying torches, you should go the other way. Because I guarantee you they're not coming to have a, like a luau or tiki party in your backyard, right? So, Jesus, knowing all that was going, on, going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So everybody in here has probably at least seen one superhero movie where a superhero lands on the ground and creates this force and knocks everybody over, right? So there's, an, there's some imagery for you. Jesus' words, I am he, created a force that caused people to fall to the ground. His, just the power of his words, okay? So here's the truth, right? Here's the truth of this statement. If Jesus wanted to get out of this, he already proved he could with just his words. Again, he asked, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so the words that he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Jesus put his life in front of the people who were with him. He put his life in front of it. Then Simon Peter, so this is the Peter we're talking about, but since there was two Peters, he went by Simon Peter, who had a sword drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now there's Malchus's 15 seconds of fame. We get to know the guy's name who Peter hit with a sword. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? There's a lot to break down in here. A lot to break down. Probably the most important thing to break down, I just walked off uh, camera again because I'm awesome at that. Um, I, we, we looked at the, the, the video feed that we were going to post online, and I kept walking all the way over here. It's a great, great video feed. So we are together as a community saying we are ready to lay our lives down, right? My first point, if you've got your, uh, your handout with you and you want to fill in the blanks along with me, is that we as a church, we love the concept of letting go. We love the idea that we can, we can turn everything that is going on in our life, whether it's good or bad, over to a higher power, a deity, God, Jesus Christ. We can hand it over to him, and we're going to be awesome because we did that. 
That's usually the belief in what we understand of letting go. I'm struggling with addiction. Well, if I let go of it and give it to God, I won't have that anymore. I'm struggling with insert anything right here, and if I let go of it and give it to God, it's just going to go away. Letting go of it is usually just the first step in dealing with something. But I have yet to find anywhere in that Bible or any Bible I've ever read that says when you accept Christ and you let it go and you surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, welcome, you're, you're, you're going to have a prosperous life, your life's going to be perfect, you're not going to have any problems. And, and if you know where that's at, please tell me because I'll gladly read it and figure out what it means. Because that's a much easier message for a preacher to get up and preach about. Hey, all you got to do is accept this and be a good Christian and serve and give and all those things and your life's going to be amazing. And there are preachers out there that preach that message. And the reason that it's so dangerous is because when people leave when it doesn't happen, they almost never come back. Because the truth is, is that Jesus' message included being tortured and killed on a cross. Jesus showed us what life of surrender looks like. And it didn't end well. But it ended well for us. Because his purpose for doing that was amazing. And when we see that letting go means something more than having a prosperous, amazing life, and what it actually means is that we have peace even in the worst storm. When we have hope that is so impossible to shoot down, even when it falls to the ground. That's what letting go means. This is, this is our human nature, right? This is our human nature that's, that, that keeps us from doing this. And we have this peter Malchus dichotomy, right? Because if we look at what Peter was actually doing in this moment, we see that, that Peter had a backup plan. Because the first time we meet Peter, he's a fisherman. And, and the first time that we see Peter interact with Jesus, Peter does something very interesting. He drops his nets and walks away from his life and surrenders completely to the mission of Jesus Christ. He drops everything. And understand that he was a fisherman. That was his identity. He was known as a fisherman. And he was quite good at it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been doing it when Jesus found him. And he dropped it. So when we first meet Peter, he's, he's letting go. He's dropping it. But what Peter took with him was a backup plan. He took a backup plan with him. And that backup plan was a sword. When we see Peter in this moment, hear this, this is important. What was Peter thinking about when he drew his sword and struck Malchus? He was thinking about himself. He was thinking about himself, and, and hear me, because we can look at that and we can see that he was standing up for Jesus, right? But really think about that for a second. What's he gonna do? Is he gonna save God? He's already acknowledged that Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, so he thinks that his sword is going to be the thing that saves God. What was really going on with Peter, and he made it clear throughout the scriptures, was that his plan didn't always match Jesus' plan. See, Peter wanted Jesus to overthrow Rome. Jesus wanted Peter, or Peter wanted Jesus to be that conquering savior, not the meek a sacrificial savior. So Jesus had already told the apostles at this point that he was going to die, that he had to die, that it was important that he die. Peter knew the plan, and he still brought his sword. Pretty incredible when you think about it that way, because that's typically what we do in our lives, right? This is my second point. We need to let go of the idea that all of this is about you. We hear the words personal relationship with Jesus Christ and we make the entire thing about us. And, and when I've talked, so I spent a lot of time talking with nuns and duns, people who have never been a part of the church, the nuns, or people who have left church for one reason or another, the duns. The duns almost always have the same thing in common. It didn't go the way they thought it would. Now, they don't say that directly. They usually tell you what the church did to them wrong to make them walk away, okay? And, and I'm not saying that churches aren't guilty of that. I've seen it first with my own eyes. But that is another way that we make this about us. And we've got to stop making it about you, about us. Because if, I think if, if Jesus had a moment to sit down and have a conversation with Peter, I think he would ask him, what are you doing? What are you doing? 
And Peter would have probably justified it by saying, they were coming to hurt you. I was protecting you. I was trying to save you. And, and think about yourself. If you're in that situation, I think every person in here who had a sword in that moment would have drawn it. We would draw the sword. I mean, think about the swords that we draw in life, right? I, uh, I took a different path to the pastorate than most pastors did. Um, when, and everybody who has mentored me and trained me and taught me has cautioned me about oversharing about my life before I knew Christ. Um, and I've never listened to a single one of them. And I'm not going to today. Um, I, I am standing up here preaching the word to you as a divorced man. Now, I've been married to my wife for a long time. We've been together since 1995. But before that, I was married to my daughter's mother. And the only reason I'm talking about it in church today is because my wife is in children's ministry. Um, but our marriage ended under the worst possible circumstances. And the, the individual that was a part of that, I had a problem with just like any man in this room would have a problem with. This was before I knew Christ. My choice to deal with it was my plan. And I'm very fortunate that he didn't press charges either time. But I chose the sword in both instances. And there's not a day that went by until I made it right with him that I didn't regret it. There's a, one instance that I'm talking about. My, my brother and my father were in town for a bowling tournament. And yes, I'm a bowling dork, so I, I will talk about it every now and then. And we were, Kendra was supposed to be dropped off. And uh, they come in, and Kendra was trying to pull away to run to us because she saw us across the bowling alley. And this, uh, this gentleman's, and I'm going to use the word gentleman because he was a fantastic stepfather to my daughter and I appreciate everything that he ever did for her, and I was so grateful that he was there. But not in that moment. In that moment, he grabbed her by the arm and gave her a swat on the butt. We're McDowell's, we're Irish. Temper's about that quick. It was a dead heat race between me, my father, and my brother, and who could get to that guy first? I got there first. Like I said, this is a different time. But I remember in that moment thinking that I had full control of this and nobody was going to do that. Nobody, somebody had crossed my line, right? I've had tense moments as a pastor. But it's always come to my mind, hey, ho, oh, you're not that guy anymore. But even as a pastor, my blood will still get up just like that, especially on the road. I'm a terrible drunk. You don't ever want to ride with me. But I remember that moment, every, I remember every moment of it vividly. Because it's one of those moments of guilt and shame that haunted me for a long time. And I understand, I'm not haunted by that guilt and shame today. And I'm not going to glorify it with details. I chose a sword. I chose this plan that God had for these people. I didn't like it. I stepped out and chose a violent path. Like I said, if I was smart enough to realize that this guy was going to be an integral part of my, my daughter's growth and formation as a child and as a person, if I'd have known that, I probably still would have done it because I was mad and because things weren't going my way. And that's, that's probably the thing that we run into, right? Because what happens when, we, when the plan doesn't go our way, we always find a Malchus. Peter, in that moment, saw the one person that was getting in the way of his plan and decided that he would physically take care of it himself with Malchus. I, I want you to hear me. The church is incredibly, incredibly famous for this. That we will step in the way of God's plan to redirect it, and we will create Malchus's. We will create ministries to combat Malchus. We will, we will ask the pastor, can you preach about those Malchuses a little bit more? And these are, these are people or, or events or things that get under our skin and we think that the church should get involved and inject ourselves into it. Let me just tell you, I am not a political person, so I'm not going to talk about politics, but it's the perfect example. Here's, here's all I'm going to say about politics. Typically what we, have a, what, we, what we do is we take our politics and we inject it into our faith. 
and it should be the other round. We should take our faith and inject it into our politics, but we get it backwards sometimes. And then we use the church and we use our faith as a political platform. Understand, that's as much as I, I'm going to talk about politics. But it's, it, in this climate, that, that happens more times than not. Think about people groups that the church has come up against. And we've, we've waged war with people groups. Look, the church has a history of picking the wrong side. But that doesn't mean that that's how we're identified. Think about it, right? Peter lopped off Malchus's ear against Jesus' wishes. And he's still the rock with which Jesus built his church. Because that's how love, grace, and mercy work. This is where love, grace, and mercy comes into the, the eternal realm, takes us out of this physical, tangible realm where we try and control the plan, where we try and control everything that we're trying to do. And we typically use a weapon. Talked about it a couple weeks ago, where sometimes that book, the Bible, the Word of God, is used as a weapon because we use it because we know what it says is right. But when we remove love from the equation, then all it is is a weapon. All it is is a weapon. And I can't find anywhere in Scripture that says, use this as blunt force trauma to beat the people you disagree with about the head. Peter wanted to save God. And all God wanted to do was save Peter. Peter wanted to save God. And had he done it, he would have prevented God from saving him. Let me just tell you, the Malchuses of the world, the driver who cut you off, the guy who took your seat on the airplane, the guy who's sitting at your seats at your concert, the guy who, the customer who irritated you, the customer service agent that irritated you, all of these people, they become the Malchuses of the world. And I want you to be careful because here's why you have to be careful. You better watch out because what happened next with Malchus is nothing short of a miracle. What happened? Jesus healed his ear. So you have to be careful who you make a Malchus because Jesus is going to heal and restore him. And they're going to become a rock with which the kingdom is grown and expanded. You've got to be careful who you make the Malchus because Jesus is going to heal him. I said during communion, if you ever want to know where God is, look around because God shows his love every day with the people he puts in our lives. I meant that. I believe that. I believe if you are having a hard time seeing God, you're not looking at the people that God's put in your life. People showing Crystal and I the love of God saved our life, saved our marriage, saved our family, saved me from being that person 23 years ago. I can't imagine what would happen if I kept my sword sheathed? I can't even imagine. My life would be so much different. But then also, how different would it be? Now, the most important thing that I want you to hear about, when the plan doesn't go right, we always find our Malchus. What Jesus is saying in this passage, what the Bible is saying in this passage, is people aren't the enemy. We look at the situation where they're coming to arrest, torture, and kill Jesus Christ, and we look at them at the, as the enemy. A lot of times, we, we, have, we have criminalized the Jewish people for what this group of Jewish people did 2,000 years ago. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that making people the enemy is ever going to be the right answer. Oftentimes, God's plan takes us through valleys. Oftentimes, God's plan takes us through peaks. But always, God's plan is the right plan. The critical part here, I think, if has anybody, has anybody here seen Passion of Christ? There's this great moment where Peter and, Peter and Malchus are looking at each other, and Peter is like, what just happened? What just happened? Imagine in today's day and age, right? I would bet you that Peter and Malchus ended up, would, would end up having coffee at Starbucks talking about what happened to them, right? Think about it. 
The gentleman that I shared about in that story, we sat down and shared a meal and talked about it. That only could happen because God's plan took back over control. We need to let go of our own perfect life plan. We might have it all planned out. I'm going to be married by this age. I'm going to have kids by this age. I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to finish school. I'm going to get my career. We're going to have it all figured out. All figured out. I have seen some of the strongest Christian people experience unimaginable things. I went to Paradise twice, Paradise, California. I went right after the fire was put out. I never, it's life changing. And I went back a couple of weeks later, and what I saw amazed me. What I saw amazed me. I saw people relying on one another. Christian people who just lost everything. Non-Christian people who just lost everything. And you know what? They were put in the same place to deal with the same issue. And I believe that the non-Christian people spoke into the Christian people's lives and vice versa. And I believe it doesn't matter what you believe or whether you call yourself a Christian or not, I believe God moved in that moment. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw people who lost everything, thank God. Thank their community. Thank their friends and neighbors doesn't mean your life's going to be perfect. But let me just assure you, it's okay to have plans. It's okay to have retirement plans. It's okay to go to school and plan your career, and it's okay with all of those things. But it's also okay to let go of it. It's also okay to let go of it and say, this is what you had planned for me. I would still be making a pretty good salary doing the easiest job in the world because I picked a career that nobody else picked. God had different plans. God had different plans. I, I can see it all over the place. We need to let go of our perfect plan. Peter's plan versus Jesus' plan is a perfect example. And the Malchus of the world, the enemy that was created in the name of God, we can't make the same mistake that Peter made. Peter would go on to deny Christ three times. Christ would go on to get... Uh, executed on the cross, and he would come back. And when he came back, he went to Peter again. When the plan didn't go Peter's way, Peter went back to his net. He went back to his other plan that was comfortable and easy because he had given up. And what did Jesus do? He made him breakfast. Jesus, made him, Jesus shared a meal with him. And he told Peter, I love you, man. I know. I know, I know what you did but I also know where your heart is. And I love you. And I'm going to build my church on you. Every one of us in this room is Peter. God will build his kingdom on you. No matter what. No matter what. Because what he did on the cross is so powerful that we don't have to live with guilt, shame, fear, resentment. But we have to let go. We have to let go. And when it gets hard, we can't go back to our nets. When things don't go our way, we can't go back to our nets. Church, to be an authentic community, and I'm going to end here, I promise, to be an authentic community means that our nets are gone. We can stay a fisherman, but we don't get to go back to the comfortable plan when, when Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do. We don't get to go back to what's comfortable, not caring about anything or just going about our way because the plan that Jesus has for us didn't go our way. You don't have to be super religious or hyper religious or the best Christian in the world to understand that this is not about you. But it's all about us. Us. You are a part of us. And you are a part of Jesus' great plan. And that plan doesn't include sacraments and traditions and all of those things, that plan includes authentic desire to serve and be who God's called us to be, which is to love one another, which is to be a community of believers, to be parents, to be grandparents, to be all of the things that God's called us to be while giving it to him completely. I want to encourage you. Will you guys bow your head with me? I... Uh, I believe that God can do an amazing work in anybody's life, no matter where they're at or what they believe. 
And I believe that we've had such an amazing run up to just where we're at right now and where we're going that I just believe that God is, is talking to somebody today. So I want, to, I want to encourage you, no matter where you're at, you've heard, you've heard three or four messages, you've seen all of these things, you've, you've heard people, you've been speaking into one another's lives, and I think that God is going to do something amazing here, and I can't wait to see what he does, and I can't wait to do that. But I want to, I want to encourage you, if God is, is, if he's doing a little, I've heard it called heart surgery on you, you're in this place where you're, ah, uh, you know, you stepped away for a while, but you're, you're here. Or, or you've never been here before, but you're here. Or you're somewhere in between. I want to give you an opportunity to, to allow Christ to do that heart surgery. We just have to enter into this place where we want to know him. We want to know more about him. So will you just pray with me today? I want to give you an opportunity first. If you're feeling that... God's speaking into your heart, and you want to know him more. You want to know him. You want to accept him for who he is. I want to give you the opportunity to do that, and then I want to give you some words to say. So if you're in that place, just everybody's heads down, everybody's eyes are closed, just lift your hands. If you're feeling like you want to recommit your life, you want to commit your life, or you just want to enter into a relationship with him, just lift your hands. Okay? Anybody else? Awesome. All right, just pray with me wherever you're at. And listen, if you didn't raise your hands or you're already there, pray this for the people who raise their hands. Dear God, I just, I surrender to you. I give this to you. And, and I, know, I know that what you did was for me and I believe that and I believe that you, everything that you said, that, that you died on a cross, that you came back, that you ascended to heaven, all those things are true and you did them for me. But more importantly, I want to know you more. Lord, I accept who you are in my life. And I let go. Start today by just letting go. We thank you for your truth, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for every, every soul in here. And Lord, I just pray that you do an amazing work in their life today. In your son's heavenly father. In your son's heavenly name. Amen.